Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the discussion series, Reimagining American Democracy. I'm Jean Meserve, and in today's in, uh, session, Disinformation and Democracy, we're going to explore how the quality of information you receive and the quality of information you produce can impact the quality of the democracy that you enjoy. What was once primarily a job of the media, collecting facts and distributing them to the public, has now been outsourced to any number of different platforms, including social media platforms. What that means is that individuals and organizations, including private citizens and politicians and even foreign entities can have an outsized impact on our perceptions of reality and that carries risks. What is it going to take to restore a shared sense of purpose through shared facts to ultimately revive American democracy? We're going to examine that question today by talking to elected officials in Georgia who grappled with disinformation during their election. We're also going to talk to experts and members of the media who are trying to strengthen our understanding of exactly what a fact is. And we're also going to hear from the social media giant at the middle of this controversy, that is Facebook. This series was made possible through a cross-partisan group of organizations, including Freedom House, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, the George W. Bush Institute, and Issue One. Before we begin, a word from our co-host, Mike Abramowitz, the president of Freedom House. I'm Mike Abramowitz, the president of Freedom House. On behalf of Freedom House and our event co-hosts, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, Issue One, and the George W. Bush Institute, I'd like to welcome you to our event series, Reimagining American Democracy. We launched this series a few months ago in order to help address a critical challenge facing the U.S. today, the health of its democracy. This is our third episode, and today we're looking for solutions to an issue central to the work we do at Freedom House. How do you prevent disinformation from destroying democracy while protecting free speech online. In a digital age, during a global pandemic, at a time when political polarization is at an all-time high, this is no easy task. Our speakers today include politicians, journalists, experts on social media, as well as executives from the social platforms many of us rely on to gather facts and information, and also to make our voices heard. With that in mind, we hope you'll join the conversation today using hashtag democracy reimagined. Thank you for being here. I hope you learned something new and enjoy. Thank you, Mike. And now, uh, once again, let me emphasize that we would love your participation. Use the chat function there on your screen to submit your questions, please. For our first conversation, a case study in disinformation and democracy, let me introduce our two panelists, Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, and COO, CFO, to the Georgia Secretary of State, Gabriel Sterling. Thank you both for being with us here today. Um, Georgia, of course, made headlines in 2020 when President Trump called into question the results of the presidential election in your state. There are many people who still believe that President Trump was right and that his claims of voter fraud in Georgia are valid. First, for the record, was the 2020 election in Georgia stolen? Secretary Raffensperger. No, the election that we had in Georgia was fair and accurate at the end of the day. I know that uh, no election is ever perfect, but if you looked at all the points that we checked out, it never would have been enough to overturn the results. The results that we read, that we reported, the ones that we certified are accurate. President Biden carried the state of Georgia. Um, Gabe Sterling, yet the narrative that it was stolen continues. Is there any way to stop that? Well, somebody asked me before what it's like when you're up against the bullhorn of the president of the United States. And I said, it's like having a shovel going against the ocean. Um, you can't stop it. In America, we shouldn't stop things because, as was pointed out, we have to be able to balance free speech while at the same time trying to make sure that people have the actual facts and we can have a shared view of what those are. The polarization and the use of social media has been become so pervasive and so weaponized. And frankly, this started, you know, years ago. If, if you go back, and the problem we have is 
partisans on both sides, they escalate. Whatever you did last year, well, they're going to do next year. They're going to they're double down and so forth and so on. So a lot, you can look at 1986 with Bork. You can look at 2000 with the not my president and stolen election and, you know, selected, not elected. That laid foundation in the same way in Georgia in 2018 with a 55,000 vote margin versus a 12,000 vote margin, uh, Stacey Abrams has still never conceded to the governorship. So we've been experiencing in Georgia for a while. And the problem we have a lot of misinformation, disinformation, oftentimes the way it's defined in real life people is if I agree with it, it must be right. If I disagree with it, it must be misinformation. So that's kind of the reality we have to look at. And do you have any thoughts on how we get over that hurdle? Well, I've had this conversation with people before. And part of the real issue we have now is because of the speed our society works at now and with social media, very rarely do we have, for lack of a better word, grownups in a room who are looking two, three, four, 10 years down the line. Everybody wants to win the news cycle. Everybody wants to win next week. The fact that the Speaker of the House called the minority leader a moron yesterday does not say a lot to how we're, we're building bridges to, of understanding and try to do things together moving forward. You say that, but you were a vocal and public critic of President Trump following his claims of voter fraud. Why did you speak out? And was that contributing to this hostile environment? Well, obviously it contributed to the hostile environment, but the truth is the truth. And this is one of my pet peeves. And I'm 50 now, so this makes me an old guy, but this whole my truth and your truth, there's just the truth. There is a set basis of just the truth and the facts. And unfortunately, like Secretary Raffensperger pointed out to the president, um, he's just had the wrong numbers. And whether he's been, mis mis been misled by other people at this point, he has to know that he lost the election, but heck, it's a great fundraising tool and you stay in the news. Uh, Secretary Raffensperger, your thoughts on, on how we get past this when you still have people saying it was a steal? I think at the end of the day, we can talk about policies, we can talk about all these ideas, but I think it gets down to character. And that's really what it gets down to is the, the values that our parents raised us by. I think we need to get back to that. Is it truthful? Is it honest? If we're not going to go back and do a really a deep dug, dive on the character, why don't we just go to Rotary and look at their four-way test? Because those four points that they put out at, at every meeting, is it helpful? Is it really going to build goodwill? And so we, we need to be mindful of what we say, because we can say things that just spin people up, but we know it's going to spin people up. So let's try and move forward. You can be a conservative, I can be conservative, people can be liberals, but we can get together, we can have conversations and try and improve the situation and come with real solutions for people. I think in an ideal world, uh, most reasonable people would agree with you, but that's not the world we're operating in right now. Both of you have received all kinds of public scoldings, even death threats uh, for the position you took on the election results in Georgia. Secretary Raffensperger, you're running for re-election. My question is why? I'm running because I wanna make sure we continue to have fair and honest elections in Georgia and we balance accessibility with security. Also, I think people know that I'm gonna stand up and make those hard calls. I'm gonna call out Fulton County when they mess up on their elections for 25 years and finally get something done about it. I wanna make sure that I stand up on the truth. As Gabe Sterling said, there is the truth and we're gonna fight to make sure we have election integrity in Georgia. Secretary Raffensperger, um, you have supported the new election laws that have been passed in Georgia. My question is, why did you need them? If you had an election that was free and fair and had an honest result, why did you have to reform anything? Well, after every election, every two years, we've always had election reform. Two years ago, we introduced House Bill 316, which moved us also off the old electronic machines to new a paper ballot system, which allowed us to do that 100% hand recount of the election. But also when I ran in 2018, I said that we need to move away from signature match to absentee balloting and move to driver's license number. They finally did that in the General Assembly this year, three years later. And so I'm gonna to continue to look at how do we make the process more fair, more objective, and remove the subjectivity out of it. I think that helps election directors, and I think it also helps voters have confidence. I'm no expert in the Georgia election law, but I understand that one aspect of it, it would allow the state legislature to overrule local boards of election. That on the face of it would seem to weaken our electoral process and perhaps uh, promote even more extreme fears of politicization of election results. What's your response to that? Well, in, 
in the business world, we, we talk about carrots and sticks. The state election board doesn't want to take over any county. But eventually, if a county has been failing since 1993, like, for example, Fulton County, now we finally have an accountability measure that if they don't improve, the state election board can then look at replacing officials and making sure that we have well-run elections. So all 159 counties run their elections well. But couldn't Jane, that be exploited for Jane, political purposes? Let me purposes. step in for one second on this. Your question in and of itself is an example of misinformation, unfortunately, because the state legislature does not really have a role in this other than to potentially kick it off. And the reality of the law is you, there has to be, there is a, a lot of due process in this. There has to be an investigation that goes for 30 days to bring it back to the state election board. And then the state election board say, yes, this body needs to be removed and replace it with somebody else. But there's also time limits on it. After nine months, the county can step in and say, you need to go. But also they can appeal it to a superior court and say, there's no basis for this. So the idea that the, that the legislature can go in and do this, and it's also limited to three counties at a time, at any given time. So the reality of it is, it's not the state legislature can come in and overturn results. And that's what many people on the left side of the spectrum have said about the law. It's simply not true. And another thing about this, yes, the secretary has supported large portions of the law. Part of the law was unnecessary. Removing him from the state election board was an unnecessary political payback from my point of view. I won't speak for the secretary on that. But the question you laid out there shows the problem with people having half information sometimes that you're asked, you were asking what I know is a sincere and honest question, but it was based on people spinning the law in a way that's not actually real. Um, I appreciate that, by the way. Um, Secretary Raffensperger, do you want to respond to what was perceived by Mr. Sterling as being retribution against you? Was it? Uh, um, I think that the law speaks for itself. At the end of the day, the Secretary of State has been the chair of the State Election Board for well over 60 years. And I called, if I would have had the ability and the power, the lawful power to fix Fulton County, I would have done that. Now you have a State Election Board that's gonna go through the process. First of all, they have to find a chair. So they had that I would be removed, but they never even put in a, a new chair. And that person has to be someone that's nonpartisan, bipartisan, has never done anything one way or the other, given money to any candidate, and yet they care passionately about elections. Uh, that's like, <laughs> I, I, I find that unicorn that cares passionately about elections, but has never leaned left or right. That's going to be an interesting choice. Uh, as you know, this new election law uh, has come under fire from various quarters, including the Department of Justice, which says it was enacted, quote, with the purpose of denying or abridging the right of black Georgians to vote. Your reaction, either one of you, both of you. I think it's an offensive statement. If you look at that bill, I think particularly if you look at now going to photo ID for absentee voting, that is supported by a majority of voters, African-American, white, any racial demographics, any political party. It's supported by both Democrats and Republicans because they understand that it's an objective measure. It's also what's being used currently in Minnesota with the Democrat Secretary of State, Democrat Governor. They've been using it successfully for years. Meanwhile, the DOJ is actually picking on Georgia, but they're not looking at what do they do in New York? What do they do in New Jersey or Delaware, President Biden's home state? We have more opportunities, more days of early voting than any of those states. And Ms. Bizarre, um, there's a reality of this that the Democrats, before Georgia passed anything, bought the domain name Jim Crow 2.0. No matter what was passed in the state, they were going to attack it. And they were basing a lot of the stuff on what was originally introduced, which was in some cases, I think, unnecessary, to the final bill. And the reality of it is they were going to raise money off this. And whatever was passed, they were going to say it's terrible and it's oppressive. Uh, the state, the Secretary Raffensperger, filed the uh, motion to dismiss yesterday. And the filing of the law of Look at this. They, they filed the DOJ lawsuit three days after the For the People Act failed. This is about fundraising. This is about politics. And what I said before remains the same. Every side keeps escalating this and politicizing this and weaponizing election administration. And somebody like Secretary Raffensperger has been saying, we got to stop doing that. We got to stop weaponizing election administration from the right or the left. But both sides are doing it. Is it doing serious damage to Americans' confidence in their electoral system? It has damaged confidence. It goes back to probably all the way back to Bush v. Gore, but it got ramped up 2016 when President Trump won. They said it was Russian collusion. Stacey Abrams lost. And then it was obviously due to voter suppression. Now we have voter fraud. All of that hurts voter confidence. 
what we've tried to do with SB202, first of all, is make election management easier for election officials, but also help voters restore that confidence that's been hit from both sides of the aisle. Well, apparently it hasn't done that, but let me get to some of our audience questions if you don't mind. Um, this is a question for you, Secretary Raffensperger. Nate Christensen asks, were there any early indicators of character that people could have identified to help inform their evaluation of people lying about the 2020 elections that voter, voters could have clued into even before 2020? What would those have been? Because you have spoken about the criticality of good character in politics. Well, we've been, uh, I tend to speak uh, with a calm demeanor, a quiet voice, and I'm very careful in the words that I use. And I think that someone that is elected in high office should always do that. I don't think uh, we need to objectify people. And perhaps that goes the way I was raised, but also I spent time in the General Assembly. I was there for two terms. And I sat next to a Democrat on my left and my right, and we'd have conversations. I didn't probably win them to my way of thinking and them to their way of thinking, but at least we had respectful conversations. But I want to make sure that we always have those conversations. But as Gabe saw it, said, we don't have a megaphone of 80 million Twitter followers. We just have our small office. And so it's easy to get swamped. Another question from Alexis Gibson who asks, um, she would like your, part, uh, your perspective as to which media you trust and rely on for truth and facts. Mr. Sterling, well, my dad, take that? Uh, <laughs> that's yours, Gabe. Well, here's the fun part. I. I watch and listen to every side of everything because it helps to shade what you what people are thinking. Um, I will admit this, I listen to NPR, but I also watch Fox News. Um, I used to watch a lot of Morning Joe, but I got a little too far out there for me uh, a few years back. But uh, I read the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, the Washington Post, New York Times, but I also believe I look at blogs. I love National Review. Um, I, I'm all over the board. I think that the main thing people have to do and it's hard to do because our, our inclination is to, I want to find people to agree with me because it makes me feel better. You have to train yourself to get away from that idea and understand that the villainizing we've done on all sides and this ramping up. And I, it wasn't just Donald Trump. We were building up to this point over the last few decades. And like I said, from my point of view, this started around in 1986 with the villainization of Robert Bork, and it just kind of escalated from there over time. And I don't know how you unwind it, but it takes somebody to be mature and, and not take advantage of things. The problems we have right now is the incentives are there to continue doing the same thing. You want to raise a lot of money? Say something outrageous and put it on YouTube. You want to get a lot of clicks? Say something outrageous and get it out there. I mean, Gateway Pundit has made a bank on, on the secretary and I themselves. So the two of you have been in the eye of the firestorm of disinformation and misinformation. Any thoughts on how we stop this? Well, Prayer. I, think, I think eventually, I think all these things play themselves out. And eventually, uh, I think people are going to find that being angry and bitter isn't a selling combination anymore because people are going to start tuning it out and moving on with their life. There's because no sign it's of not that happening all. though. I disagree with that. I Jay. think bit by bit. Yeah. I think bit by bit people are looking for alternatives or they're just plugging out and doing other things, getting on with their life, decide they're going to take up walking, hiking, you know, uh, whatever they want to do, but they're going to do more productive things. And I think that's a good thing. I think also, as Gabe said, listening to plenty of sources. You know, my dad always said, you can't believe everything you read. And I think people need to, you know, look at different things that are how they're said, where they're said. But I think when people are angry and bitter all the time, I think being weaned on a pickle isn't an attractive way to grow a party and to really grow and win elections. Mr. Sterling, last word from you. Um, the main thing I was going to say was I have consistent faith in the American people to get through these kind of situations. We've been through people like this, is the worst time ever. I think the civil war was pretty bad. I think we had massive bombings in the late seventies. I mean, late sixties, early seventies, that was pretty terrible too. What I have faith in is the fact we have a generation of, of young people now who've been raised with the internet, who are much more jaundiced about what they look at and understand and accept as reality than people who are in there, like my age, 50s, 60s going up. I hate saying my age, 50s, 60s, but I'm there now. So they, they are much more inclined to believe the things that are well-produced and well-seen Younger folks are a lot more discerning 
And that's not to be ageist or anything. It's just the reality I've seen of, of amount about who is accepting these kind of things. And we have to leave it there. Thank you to both Secretary Raffensperger and Gabriel Sterling, both of you from the state of Georgia. Appreciate your being here. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. And we'll be back in just a moment with our second panel. And we're back. Uh, let me introduce our In Pursuit of Truth panel. Please welcome NPR's White House correspondent, Aisha Roscoe, Stephen Brill, the co-CEO of the Trust Ratings Tool NewsGuard, and Renee DiResta, Technical Research Manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory. When it comes to the facts, we are, of course, an incredibly fractured society, different groups with different perceptions of what the truth might be. I'm wondering about the impact on American democracy. So let me ask you all first, lightning round, can American democracy survive without a shared set of facts? Renee, why don't I go to you first? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. I would argue, um, no, it can't. And it's because one of the challenges facing us today is really that there is a loss of trust and a loss of confidence in, uh, in a lot of the foundational elements of uh, the democratic process, and particularly things like trusting the outcome of an election is core and critical to, uh, to, to continuing the functioning of democratic elections. Stephen, your thoughts? Can we survive if we don't all agree on, on what's true? Well, uh, what we're seeing is real evidence that it can't survive. Um, we've always had, you know, people who uh, you know, uh, who didn't believe in institutions and didn't believe in real facts. I wrote a book about uh, three years ago where I stumbled over an amazing fact, which was at the time, this is 2018, uh, 10 to 15% of Americans thought that Barack Obama was born outside the United States and was a Muslim. And 10 to 15% of Americans thought that 9-11 was an inside job by the Bush administration. So you have people on radically different sides of the aisle, shall we say, who just don't believe in basic facts. And one of the things uh, that NewsGuard tries to do is to present its ratings in a way that distinguish um, opinion from fact. It is a fact that 9-11 was not an inside job. It is a fact that apricot pits will not cure cancer. Um, Aisha, as you know, trust in the media has dropped precipitously in recent years. Wondering why you think that is as someone who still practices journalism on a daily basis. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that part of it, uh, well, first of all, I, I think we, I, we have to step back a little bit because uh, there has been at this point, a lack of trust in the media Part of it is because there's so much information that people can get from all over. And the first panel touched on this, how basically people can cater their media to hear what they want to hear. They can confirm their biases. They can get, you know, if they feel that apricots cure cancer, they can find uh, research to support that, <laughs> right? Like that is part of the In issue. In fact, the website that says that has a hundred times the traffic as uh, the Mayo Clinic. Right. Yes, absolutely. So and and so people can pick and choose and they don't have to be necessarily discerning. So I think that is a part of the issue. I, I think that as a media, though, we also have to accept that there have been parts of this country, communities in this country that have not felt represented by the media for a very long time. This is not new. They have not trusted institutions because institutions have not looked out for them. People of color, black people, black communities have not trusted the media because they felt like they were misrepresented. They felt like their views were not being heard. And they haven't felt like, and many have felt like there, there hasn't been a shared presence of facts and how this country is operating. So I think that you have to go even beyond just this current uh, time frame and look at how media has worked in general for many, many years. Well, One into that breach of trust steps, uh, you know, Facebook uh, to create 
um, a trillion dollar or $2 trillion market cap uh, company. Their algorithms take advantage of that lack of trust. And I know that uh, Nick Clegg is gonna be on a panel that is pre-recorded, but I wish he were on this panel and he could explain to us why their algorithm is not only allowing that to happen, but encouraging it to happen. I, I, and we're gonna talk a lot more about social media with Renee and the role it plays, but I, I'm, I'd like to delve a little bit into the, into the media's own responsibility. Stephen, you touched on this when you talked about the blurring of the lines between editorial and reporting. Um, but Margaret Sullivan this week in the Post wrote that the mainstream media is equalizing the unequal in an effort to appear unbiased. She said it needs to reframe coverage with a pro-democracy frame. Aisha, again, as someone on the front lines, what do you think of that approach? It is a very real issue because sometimes objectivity is um, deemed to be uh, people who have no stake in issues, you know, this kind of voice of God coming from on high, when that is just simply not the truth. And I'm not talking about taking a position, but or, or saying this is the way things should be or this is the way things should go. But there is a, a, a thing of, of saying that this is the reality. This person who is in a place of power is not telling the truth. And that is not the same as uh, there is there's a difference between politicians disagreeing on whether to raise taxes or not and disagreeing over whether the Constitution should work and, and, and another uh, president should be installed because we don't like the outcome of the election. So just kind of going, well, both both sides to do it is not the same. Like, I, I think that there are times where the media tries to say, do this all sides, everyone's doing it, when there are very different things happening. It's very different to say, well, I have questions about this election versus I absolutely won. I'm actually still in charge uh, and, and maybe I'll be president in August. Like that is what is some of, that's what is happening in this country with a presidential candidate uh, who lost, former President Trump. And, and you can't equalize those things. You can't say that both of those things are the same. Stephen, do you well, want to quickly weigh on this point? I, want well, I don't think anybody's really done that. I don't think Margaret um, is right about that in terms of uh, not only the mainstream media, but, uh, but most media. You know, I don't think NPR has, uh, you know, has said as a matter of reporting that there are two, uh, there are two sides to the story of whether uh, you know, President Trump lost the election. So the press does tend to do that in more um, um, in situations that aren't as clear cut, but I don't think you can make an argument that in terms of the election or in terms of, uh, you know, even vaccines, uh, the two big, uh, you know, hoax issues of the day that uh, the press is really saying on the one hand, on the other hand. Renee, why is it that on social media, the disinformation and misinformation spreads faster, further, deeper? Well, it's a function of the affordances and the, the tools that people are given, as well as algorithms that serve as curators. So it's not just the algorithms, it's also people who are choosing to, choose to share it, people who see something and choose to perpetuate it. Um, you know, we're in an environment where there's just sort of these perpetually online factions that are fighting for um, the ability to define reality, fighting to amplify their, in, you know, to, to kind of bolster their influencers, amplify the points of view that, that they find most believable or most favorable. And so they, they uh, will, you know, will sit there and will continue to tweet out and post the content that, um, that kind of, you know, aligns with their beliefs. And it's, it's much more of a, um, I think, um, kind of like a cluster of like federated bespoke realities at this point, depending on which one you occupy, there's a different version of the truth. And, and that's one of the real challenges. So it's not that information is really evenly distributed among them. There's very different media types that are you know, influencers who um, resonate with and, and are treated as authority figures within each of those different kind of bespoke realities. And Renee, what do you think the responsibility is of the social media companies to curb this? Are they taking this seriously enough? Well, they are taking it seriously. I mean, it just took them, uh, you know, about seven years to take it 
seriously. And that's part of the problem because one of the things that social media is responsible for is the foundational structure of those realities and the fact that they were actively pushing people into those groups and actively recommending those groups for a period of many, many years. In fact, uh, they knew about this. It was internally fairly well documented that their recommendation engines in particular were routing people into communities that were not necessarily, um, you know, the kinds of places that most people would consider to be um, the, you know, good. I think that they use the term. So, so are their efforts now sufficient? The only place I disagree, I think, with Renee is her use of the past tense. Um, they are still recommending um, you know, anti-black sites right now. I mean, we just did a report a couple of days ago um, where we demonstrated that if you look at one piece of anti-vax misinformation, they will quickly recommend all kinds of other, uh, you know, groups that have the same stuff. Uh, uh, what Facebook and Nick Clegg have done is they've said, well, 2 billion people have gotten accurate information about uh, the virus and about uh, the vaccine on uh, Facebook. So that means they have the data. What they haven't said, and what I hope he says maybe in uh, the interview that's coming up, is how many people, according to their data, which they have, how many people have seen anti-vax information? Um, Audrey Tang, who's Taiwan's digital minister. Um, I interviewed her a couple of months ago. She talked about her country's all hand on deck approach to social media. One of the things she talked about was that in the government ministries, there are these sort of strike teams that when they see a piece of disinformation, they immediately counter it. And sometimes they use humor to do that. But she says, if the disinformation is out there for more than six hours, it's too late. Is that, Renee, a realistic approach for a country like the United States? Well, it, the answer is kind of, it depends. So she's right in that the longer something is, uh, is out there, then more people are going to see it and then more opportunity it has to go viral. And so that's definitely a component. It's very hard to correct someone or to change opinions or perception after the fact. So that, that need to detect early is, is key. But one of the things that we see in countries in which there is, um, in which government responses are effective is there's a high degree of trust in government. And so Sweden, for example, has some really excellent work that they've done on uh, you know, helping their citizens recognize propaganda and, and uh, particularly disinformation campaigns. Estonia is another place where we've seen some really strong efforts. Taiwan has, you know, their, uh, their government does a lot of very proactive work recognizing that there's kind of an information threat targeting their citizenry and helping them understand um, where they're vulnerable on that front. The challenge in the U.S. is the, you know, who is who has the moral authority to, to serve as the corrector? And that's the that's the unfortunate morass that um, that we find ourselves in now, which is, as I mentioned, uh, depending on which segment of the population you live in, you're, you're trusting very different media. And for a very long amount of time now, there's been very coordinated efforts on the part of certain media properties to erode confidence, even in the ability of an outside entity to fact check. The fact checkers are biased. The government is biased. This representative is biased. That representative is biased. You can't trust X, Y, and Z. And it creates the perception that uh, it's too hard to know who to trust. And so the only person you can trust is that, that influencer or that media property that's telling you all of this. And so one of the key challenges is it's very hard to tell someone, no, this information is not true. Uh, this is not the facts. As, you know, the prior panel on election integrity or on, on uh, election um, results was articulating. Uh, this is exactly the challenge we face, which is when you trust Newsmax and Newsmax is telling you something, uh, it's telling you what you want to hear. You see people who are not going to be receptive to any fact check of Newsmax's um, content, whether that's government, media, or you know any other party at this point. Stigle, but the other challenge is we don't really want the would government. You, would you explain to us what NewsGuard does and how you're trying to address the issue? Sure. We're built on the notion that we don't want the government uh, to tell us what we should read or what we should believe. Um, what NewsGuard do, it does is it uses um, uh, journalists who are trained as journalists to read and, and rate the overall reliability and trustworthiness of what are now all the websites in the United States responsible for 97% of all engagement. And we use uh, a nine specific standards of journalism practice. We publish a nutrition label with each rating that explains in great detail uh, 
exactly why we rated the site the way we did. We always call the site for comment if we're going to say anything negative about them, and we include their comments. Uh, more than 900 sites have now changed uh, something about their practice in order to get a higher rating from NewsGuard. But at its core, what we depend on is giving people transparent information about the reliability of the source. And that results in the, in, uh, the ability to pre-bunk a hoax. Um, I'll give you one example very quickly. Uh, before January 2020, there were lots of websites that were saying that 5G causes cancer. In January 2020, guess where they pivoted? They pivoted to 5G causes COVID-19. Before they published their first article, they already had our red rating with the explanation that they're publishing hoaxes about the effects of 5G. So we had pre-bunked uh, what they were saying about uh, the virus. And, and that's a process that, the, uh, that again, depends on total transparency, total accountability, and depends on people um, reading uh, the ratings, looking at the icons, and then deciding for themselves whether they want to believe this or whether because of the way we've rated the site, they should probably take it for a grain of salt. If that site has said that 5G causes cancer, maybe they shouldn't believe uh, that they're now saying uh, that 5G causes the virus. I want to quickly get to a couple of audience questions. Jane Schumacher asks, what degree of input and influence do you think entities foreign and non-state motivated by the potential for the decline of U.S. governments have in the social media and blogosphere? Renee, that sounds like one for you. The responsibilities, I'm not totally sure I follow, sorry. The, um... She wants to know to what degree are are uh, foreign entities messing with us through social media? Basically. Oh, it's not even, it's, it's, it's such a small percentage compared to the uh, impact of domestic, um, domestic propaganda at this point that it's really, uh, it, it's, it's a very, I think, convenient thing to point to, to say, oh, Russia doesn't want you to vaccinate your children. That's not the case. That's not who's actually driving anti-vaccine misinformation. Foreign actors tend to participate in, you know, they, they work to exacerbate divisions. They'll amplify one side versus another. But in terms of pure volume, in terms of real influence and reach, it is very much at this point a problem of, uh, of, of domestic, domestic media, uh, hyper-partisan media and influencers. Aisha, you're out in the field every day interacting with people. I'm wondering whether you have the impression that people are interested in getting rid of the disinformation or misinformation? Or are they so embedded in their own realities that they're just not receptive to tools like NewsGuard? I think that people do want to get rid of disinformation, misinformation. Uh, the, the problem is that people disagree on what it is and you know what is misinformation to them. I, a lot of people feel like they're not spreading misinformation, even if it's not based in facts. I, I do believe that the media needs to do a better job of having transparency, having accountability, so people can understand where the media comes from. Because oftentimes part of that distrust in the media is people feel like there are sponsors or the government is telling people what to say on CNN. That is not true, but there, there is a feeling that uh, that the media is another arm of corporations or the government and is not telling the truth. So I have to go out and seek the real truth, uh, which is often uh, it, which is often misinformation. Renee, we're almost out of time, but I know you've come up with the idea of possibly crowdsourcing truth to try to come to some sort of um, shared reality. Can you explain that? Well, it wasn't so much crowdsourcing truth. It's that um, as people are trying to make sense of evolving, developing, breaking situations, one of the things that we see is they're constantly looking to social media, kind of checking their feeds to try to find the latest information. And as things evolve right now, we're in this weird period where any incorporation of new information and leading to the changing of a policy or the changing of an official's mind is seen as a flip-flop, as a, as a backpedal, as something bad as opposed to new information has come out and they have changed their mind, which is what, you know, in a rational environment one would expect to happen. And so the question becomes, is there a better way to, to surface that process to help the public see that evolving consensus, to see that 
Um, you know, using COVID as an example, um, at this point in time last year, we didn't necessarily know how transmission was happening. We've gone through a series of different, you know, research studies that scholars and scientists have, have undergone uh, that has in fact led to things like um, the conversation around whether it's airborne uh, findings and, and opinions from early 2020 are distinctly different from findings and opinions in July 2021. Is there a way to present that information to use kind of almost like a Wikipedia model where there is a uh, like a kind of a version history and a contributor uh, record so that people can see how these different types of arguments, how these different types of uh, facets of information have developed over time. And unfortunately, we have to leave this conversation there. I want to thank Stephen Brill and Aisha Roscoe and Renee Duressa all for joining us here today. Um, for our final interview, we interviewed Nick Clegg uh, of Facebook on Monday. Um, that interview is coming up in just a moment. Nick Clegg, thanks so much for joining us today. In the interest of full disclosure, Nick and I did serve together on the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity until he resigned upon taking his position at Facebook. Uh, thanks a lot, Nick, for joining us here today. It's great to be with you. Facebook is a behemoth. 70% of Americans log on regularly to the platform. So I wanna to talk today about Facebook's obligation to provide accurate and factual information and what the implications are for American democracy. So let me start here. Who is responsible for the accuracy of the information on Facebook? We all have a sort of shared responsibility. The people who post the content, of course, you know, social media is very different to traditional publications in the sense that you'll be relieved to hear Mark Zuckerberg's not like a newspaper editor. He doesn't say, you know, this goes on page four and we're going to do that investigation, that subject. That's the great emancipating, if disruptive thing about social media. It's people using new technologies for free because they're paid for by advertising to express themselves on a scale never seen before. And that candidly brings to the surface the good, the bad and the ugly of what people want to say. And so uh, I think we all have a responsibility, primarily, of course, people who are posting content. But what we can do at Facebook is, is obviously remove and block things that would lead to direct harm. But in terms of trying to connect people, particularly at election time, to useful information so they get reliable, authoritative information about what's going on in an election campaign, we can create resources. We did that in, in the US elections last year. We created a voter information center and directed 140 million people to it, 33 million people, would you believe it, on election day alone. And, and that also helped, I think, over four and a half million uh, Americans register to vote who otherwise wouldn't have registered to vote. So we can do that. We can work hand in glove with fact checkers. We've got about 80 fact checkers in, I think, over 60 languages around the world. And they can independently label things as missing context or false or partly false. But here's the big but, Gene. At the end of the day, the, the, the right to talk gibberish to the right to sort of, you know, you know, talk nonsense is a fundamental right in a free society. I don't think anyone would want a Silicon Valley company to be an absolute truth police and only to allow people to say whatever pops into their brain and express it on social media if it's first been vetted for absolute factual accuracy. So that's not the territory I think anybody, you know, should, in my view, want Facebook to go in. But we can do a lot you know, a lot besides that, we can block stuff that's harmful. We can point people to authoritative information. We can fact check and use independent fact checkers so people can have um, available to them independent verification of stuff that's being posted. But as, it's a difficult well balance know, to strike Nick, for which we all have a responsibility. As you well know, Nick, vaccine disinformation is running rampant all across the internet. Um, and there have been some who have suggested that Section 230, which has shielded platforms like yourself from any liability for posting inaccurate and wild content, uh, should be uh, re reformed in some way. Um, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I think it, I think it should be reformed. It's, it's, it's 25 years old. It's, it's, it's not surprising that it's starting to sort of show its age. It so was... what should the new Section 230 look like? Well, in, in our view at Facebook, what would make sense would be um, a reform of Section 230, which in effect says the following, says to you know, big platforms like you know, YouTube and TikTok and Twitter and Facebook, look, you guys have got to show us 
in other words, us, the, 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 the American people, through their legislators and through a, a, perhaps a dedicated regulator that would need to be established for this purpose, you've got to show us that you've got proper systems to coherently monitor what's on your platform, to, to act in, in, in pursuit of the standards which you have, setting out what is and what is not allowed on your platform. You've got to do that transparently and accountably. And if you don't do that properly, then the immunity or the, the, the immunity from liability, the content liability, that you enjoy under Section 230 could be taken away from you. In other words, to make that immunity from content liability conditional on having the standards, the processes and systems in place to properly moderate content on our platforms. I think that would strike the right balance between putting the responsibility on the platforms to have the systems in place without getting into what I think would be very, very perilous territory, which is having legislators sort of line by line deciding what kind of adjective, adverb and content they, they, you know, they individually like. No one wants so, that. So that's a long-term strategy. But in the short term, President Biden has said that Facebook is killing people because of vaccine disinformation. What are you going to do? Well, to be fair to President Biden, I, th I think he sort of said that he wasn't saying uh, he clarified his remarks he and, and said back. that it's true. Yes. Well, sure, sure. But um, I, I've had, you know, subsequent meetings with with members of the administration. We have uh, ongoing meetings with the administration, as we do with governments around the world, to explain what we do to ensure that people who use our services have access to authoritative information about COVID. We have a COVID information centre, which over two billion people around the world have used. And, you know, it's, it's not as if there's sort of inactivity. Facebook alone has removed, I think, around 86 million pieces of COVID misinformation, but which how, we judge would be a damage. universe. How big a universe of misinformation? Well, is well, we you can measure the outcome. So what we what we measure, and we have we have surveys which we do uh, with uh, universities like the Car Carnegie Mellon University. It's the largest survey of its kind anywhere in the world. Uh, millions of people have replied, uh, you know, explaining what they think about COVID information online and so on. And we've seen that since January, there's been a 15 percent decline in vaccine hesitancy amongst the millions of Americans who use Facebook. And it now now around 85 percent of American Facebook users uh, actually accept and believe in vaccine. So we're seeing actually measurable steps in the right direction. We have labeled around 167 million pieces of COVID content because we think or our fact checkers rather think that they are inaccurate so we can always try and do more we must always try and do more um we cannot eliminate people's right in a free society to express reservations about how the pandemic has been conducted not least by the way because scientific consensus changes you'll remember for instance facebook used to remove claims that covid was human made then the then the scientific consensus shifted and said well maybe it is and then if we had to shift with that so, you know, it isn't a static line and we constantly consult with experts and scientists to try and draw the line in the right place. So a couple of points. One, I don't think it's possible to draw a clear connection between what people are reading on Facebook and their vaccine hesitancy. But beyond that, there are critics who say that you're doing this in a very piecemeal fashion, that you still haven't found a systematic way to stop disinformation, whether it's about vaccines or politics or something else? Well, I, I, would accept, I accept, Gene, this will always be a contested place because one person's offensive speech or speech which they think shouldn't be allowed is another person's right to free expression. And we are an American company based and rooted in American values, rooted in the First Amendment tradition in the United States, which doesn't believe that there is, you know, everything goes. It's not a free for all. So we do, uh, you know, we do remove, which is our ultimate sanction, millions and millions of pieces of content, which we think would lead to direct real world harm. But we also want to give people real latitude to express their opinions, even if those opinions are not always completely accurate, or even if they might cause offense to others. We cannot cleanse the internet. And I think no one would want us to pasteurize the content. Uh, because I'll tell you why, not least in the United States, there is such a vigorous and polarized debate about what speech is and is not allowed. And we are trying to represent, or we're trying to serve the whole country. And at the moment in the United States, as you know, we have the left saying that we don't take down enough content and the right saying we take down too much. I don't believe the right and the left are ever gonna agree on this. In the meantime, we try and do the right thing and we try and be as transparent and consistent in the rules that we apply and the rules that we set out very openly for everybody to be able to, for everybody to, be able to look at 
and examine themselves. So you did deplatform your oversight board, deplatform the former president, Donald Trump. Did you go too far? Well, we, we, we acted in, a, in accordance with what an independent body told us um, was in our rights to do. And, and, you know, the oversight board, which is the first of its kind, no other tech companies established. This is an independent panel of highly authoritative people from around the world, from the right, from the left, from all wings of the political spectrum. They looked at it and they said the gravity of what happened at the time of the, the insurrection on, on, on the Capitol on January the 6th and the, and, and, and the content that the then President Trump uh, issued in a way which clearly they felt incited people who were involved in the violence uh, and the disruption on that day. They felt that was of such a great gravity that we were in our rights to uh, say that he no longer had the rights to uh, post content on Facebook. But I should be clear, other platforms have removed him permanently. We have said, no, we're not, we're not imposing a permanent ban. We're imposing what, imposing what we think is a proportionate um, uh, time-bound uh, uh, suspension uh, of, of two years. Uh, and we believe that is in line with the guidance that were given by this independent oversight board. So I'm curious as to what effect it's had. Have you seen a reduction in the flow of political disinformation since he's been deplatformed? Or have you seen a decline in the number of Facebook users? I think what you've, you know, what we've generally seen, because we're no longer in the throes of an immediate electoral cycle, is the sort of sheer intensity of the heat and fury that you saw up to uh, the election in November last year, and then, of course, continuing right through um, the, 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 the elections in some of the particular states, uh, and then, of course, the events in early January. I think there's been a reduction in the temperature generally. If you look at readership of, of newspapers, for instance, they've, 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 in some cases, they've plummeted because political... Uh, uh, sort of interest has, has and, waned. And I tell you what we have heard. Because he's deplatformed. Well, I think it's, it may be. I think it's partly also to, to, to do with, and I certainly remember this in my own 20 years in politics, politics goes in, in cycles and, you know, there will be another peak, no doubt, at the midterm elections next year. I'll tell you what we have heard, Jean, I can share this with you. We did get very, very clear and loud feedback from users, and not just in the US, interestingly, but around the world, uh, uh, during the particularly the latter months of last year, and it's been continuing since then, that many, many Facebook users don't like to have that much political content in their newsfeed. Now, one of the things that is often misunderstood is there's an assumption, particularly in the, amongst, dare I say it, the sort of coastal elites that talk and write about politics in, in the United States, that social media is completely full, brimming to the full with political content. In fact, Political and so-called civic content only con constitutes about 6% of the total content on Facebook. Most of the content on Facebook is, you know, babies, bar mitzvahs, barbecues. It's everyday, innocent, playful stuff. It's small businesses trying to make a living. And what we've definitely heard from many of our users is that that's what they, that's why they cherish social media, not for people to start shouting to each other about politics. And that's a clear signal we've heard from users. And we're clearly now considering how we should be responsive to that message from our users. So... I'm curious about a couple of things. There are people who study the issue of disinformation, who say that Facebook itself hasn't studied it closely enough, that you don't understand yet exactly how it is that it spreads so far and so fast. Valid criticism? Um, I think valid in the sense that more research can always be done. Um, invalid criticism in the sense that if it suggests that somehow we're not being active on this front, I, I think that is uh, actually any reasonable person would say it's unfair. For instance, we have entered into Facebook an unprecedented cooperation with more than a dozen researchers looking into how Facebook was used by voters in the run up to the US elections. We've provided them with unprecedented data sets that have never been shared with researchers before. They've recently clarified that they hope to be publishing the fruits of their research independently of Facebook. Uh, from, I think, the early, uh, in the first half of next year. So, of course, there's more to learn. There's always more research to be done. In fact, quite a lot of the independent research that's been done uh, about the relationship, for instance, between social media and polarization actually, if anything, shows quite different conclusions to what you might think. Stanford, for instance, last year looked in depth at trends in nine countries over 40 years and found that in many countries, polarization was either on the rise before Facebook even existed, and in others it's been decreasing while 
uh, the, the use of Facebook uh, has been increasing. So the idea that there is always a causal link between social media and polarization is not true. And in fact, some other studies, have credible studies, have shown that in the United States, um, uh, polarization has increased the most amongst the demographic groups that are least likely to use the internet. You say you share data. Some researchers say you haven't shared enough. They want to know more about your algorithms and, and how this whole ecosystem of social media works. Will you open more information up for an independent audit that will oh, that explore how you work? Well, as I say, we're already, we, we're going, we've gone further than that already. So we've already committed to providing unprecedented data sets to independent researchers. Well, of course, everybody always wants more and we will always seek to do more. We've, we've already said that, for instance, in terms of how newsfeed is algorithmically ranked, but not, by the way, not only that we'll explain more about the signals that we use, and there are multiple, multiple signals from the device that you're using for the time of day, from the kind of stuff that you've shared with your friends and the groups you're members of, we will, we will provide more and more of that information, but we'll go even further than that, G. And we've recently given users the ability to, in effect, override the algorithm altogether, literally say, I don't want Facebook to algorithmically rank what I see first, second, third, fourth, fifth on my newsfeed. I want to, I want to in effect, curate it myself. And that's Although, a new thing that we mentioned, we've... some people are perfectly happy within their bubble. Polarization, well, you claim, uh, independent of Facebook. Yes, but again, the research, and again, this is what independent researchers, since you quite rightly laid such emphasis on them, have shown that uh, oddly enough, because most people on Facebook have a range of friends who, you know, stretch from childhood friends to, you know, work uh, colleagues to people they've played, played sports with, you tend to have a more heterogeneous and mixed ideological composition of your friends on Facebook than you do if you read the same partisan newspaper or read or watch the same cable uh, TV news outlet. So social media is not as narrow in terms of its ideological diet. This is what independent researchers have, 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 have proven that is often asserted. Nick, some people say you're really not interested in end, ending the, the, the controversy uh, and the um, very inflammatory content because it makes you money. So what's the greater interest for Facebook? Is it money or is it democracy? So I, I flatly and, and vigorously reject this idea that Facebook has an incentive to spoon feed people sort of addictive, extreme, violent, unpleasant, hateful content. Why on earth would we want to do that? If we were to do that, people would not continue to use Facebook in five years time, 10 years time, 15 years time. It, we know from our own research that if you want people to use Facebook for the long term, which we have a business interest in doing, it, we, we're not interested in having someone addicted to using Facebook for 20 extra minutes. We want, this, we want this social media experience to be a wholesome, meaningful one for the next 20 years. And that's why we take down as much hate, hateful speech. And, to, and just to prove the case, we have recently published a verifiable uh, data which shows that the prevalence of hate speech is now as low as 0.05%. That means, Gene, that for every 10,000 bits of content, you, will, you might see five bits of hate speech. I wish, it, I wish it was zero. Unfortunately, there are always human beings who want to issue this bile and this hateful speech. We, we, we catch the vast majority of it before anyone reports it to us. I don't think we're going to change human nature, but the idea that we have an incentive to prioritize this is, I think, one of the most misleading allegations of, of uh, the, the, the numerous critics that social media has these days. And Nick Clegg, we have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And that concludes our episode on disinformation and democracy. Thanks to all of you for joining us and for weighing in with your opinion. Our next episode on election security is coming up on September 30th. It is free and you can register at reimaginingdemocracy.org. In the meantime, please continue the conversation on social media, hashtag democracy reimagined. I'm Jean Meserve. We'll see you next time.